children, welcome to my writing segment. Today, we will learn how to write a paragraph expressing your opinion. In this section, I will show you the common phrases you can use to give opinions, how to make a plan for your writing, how to write reasons and examples to support your opinion. Before we continue, you will need a copy of this graphic organizer. This graphic organizer will be useful later because there will be a task for you to complete. You may want to copy this on a piece of paper first. Are you ready? Let's begin. Your opinion is what you think or feel about something. People can have different opinions. Some people may be of the opinion that pizza is healthy, while others feel that pizza is unhealthy. That's their opinion. We can share our opinions with others by writing about them. In today's program, we will look at phrases you can use to share your point of view. Many phrases are suitable in everyday speech and some types of writing such as on blogs and personal websites. You have probably already seen or used some of these phrases. I think, I believe, I feel, in my opinion, I would say. For example, imagine you have your own food website and you are writing or talking about the world's best street food. You might say, In my opinion, Penang has the best street food in Malaysia. Now, let's look at a few phrases that are more common in formal situations. You might, for example, hear one of these at a business meeting or a conference or in a formal paper. From my point of view, from my perspective, it seems to me that, in my view, here's an example. In my view, the use of plastic bags should be banned. They are made from non-renewable sources and contribute to climate change. Now, are you ready to start writing your opinion? Our topic is, e-books are much better than paper books and will eventually replace them. Do you agree? Before we continue, let's define what is ebooks. Many dictionaries define the ebook as an electronic version of printed book. Ebooks are usually read on hardware devices known as e-readers or ebook devices. Personal computers and some mobile phones can also be used to read ebooks. You can use the graphic organizer that I showed you just now to plan your writing. Let me show you. I'll put my opinion in the middle and the four reasons around it. Remember, giving reasons and examples will add strength to your opinion. Here's the plan. My opinion is that e-books are better than paper books. Now, I need to think of some reasons to support my opinion. I can ask myself, why are e-books much better than paper books? Paper books, especially hardcover editions, can be very heavy. I really like using e-books as they can be safe on devices that are small and handy to be carried anywhere. So, I will add this reason to my graphic organizer. Hmm, what else? Oh, we can save paper and trees by reading e-books. It is more environmentally friendly than paper books. So, I will add eco-friendly. I also feel that using e-books is very easy. I can have access to thousands of books anywhere since e-books are just digital copies carried in devices. If I have to go for a long tour, I definitely don't want to carry a lot of books in my luggage. 
I just need one more reason. I think using ebooks is also great because I can have access not only to bookshops but also libraries. Many libraries now offer ebook loans in addition to their print book offerings. There, my plan is complete, so I'm ready to start writing. First, I will write the topic sentence by stating my opinion. And then, I'm going to write the reasons to support my opinion based on the plan of my writing. Ebooks are becoming more and more popular and there are many reasons for this. In my opinion, ebooks are better than paper books. Firstly, ebooks are quite lightweight, making it much more portable than physical books. Ebooks are also more eco friendly than paper books. By having electronic versions of books, we save paper, trees, and indirectly our planet. Now, for the next reason, I also include some examples. Besides, ebooks are in many ways more convenient than paper books. For, for instance, you can store thousands of ebooks in the same space you would need for one paper book. Just think of how convenient that can be for school or when travelling. Here, I also use linking words and phrases like besides and for instance to connect my ideas. And for the last reason, in addition to online bookshops, many lending libraries also have ebook collections now. In other words, if you want to buy or borrow a book, you don't have to wait for opening hours or delivery. The way I see it, ebooks are the future and will eventually take the place of paper books. I have finished my paragraph by rephrasing my opinion. So, now I have a complete paragraph with all four of my reasons to support my opinion about ebooks. Now, it's your turn to try it. You can write your opinion about how paper books are better than ebooks. Use the graphic organizer to give your reasons and write a paragraph expressing your opinion. Remember, when you write, state your opinion clearly. Develop the paragraph by stating your supporting arguments and any necessary explanation. If possible, Give examples to make your point clear. End the paragraph by rephrasing your opinion or making a general comment. Don't forget to use linking words or phrases to list points, add points, give examples and your opinion. That's all the tips I can think of for this section. I hope you have learned new things from this video. Thank you for watching. Bye! Hello students! Today we are going to learn how to use the simple present tense correctly. English language is unique because the verb is always affected by time or when the action has taken place. Sometimes the subject in the sentence can also affect the spelling of the verb. As a result, each tense has different types of forms and functions. To make things easier for you, I have divided this lesson into several parts. First, we are going to learn the functions of the simple present tense. Next, I'm going to explain the grammatical rules of the simple present tense. And lastly, I will test your understanding by asking you to identify errors from a list of sentences. Follow my instructions and you should be able to use the simple tenses correctly in no time. So, what are we waiting for? Let's begin! The simple present tense has two functions. First, we use the simple present tense to state a general truth or fact. 
for example. The sun rises in the east. This is a fact that we see every morning when we wake up from sleep. The sun will always rise in the east because of the earth's rotation. Or we can say, the moon shines at night. The moon only shines at night because its surface reflects light from the sun. Because the sun shines too bright, we can't see the moon's reflection during the day. These are just two examples. Secondly, we also use the simple present tense to show a habitual action. This can be an action that we do regularly or a habit. For instance, He drives to work every morning. This means that this person drives his car to work at least five days a week. He does not use other types of transportation to get to work except by his car. Hence, it is a habit. Or we can say, we wear baju melayu to school every Friday. This means that the students regularly wear baju melayu to school on that day of the week. It is something that they do often. Hence, this too is a habit. Simple, isn't it? I already gave you two examples to show how the simple present tense can be used to show a habitual action. Can you think of any other examples of habit in your life? It could be something that you do every day or every week. Next, I'm going to show you how to write a correct sentence when you are using the simple present tense. To write a complete sentence, we need to have a subject and a verb. The subject is the doer of an action. A subject can either be a noun or a pronoun. A verb, on the other hand, is an action that has taken place in an event. The subject can also be divided into two types, which are singular subject and plural subject. A singular subject means that there is only one person involved in the action. While a plural subject means that there is more than one person involved in the action. The subject plays an important role when we are using the simple present tense in a sentence. This is because the verb is always affected by the subject. Let's look at these examples to have a clearer picture about this rule. First, let's choose the subject for our sentence. Let's start with singular subject. We can choose the boy as a subject. We know it is a singular subject because we didn't add an S to the end of the noun. We can also use singular pronouns like he or she. Or we can use proper nouns like Ali or Rachel. For the plural subject, we can choose the boys as a subject. We know it's plural because we add S to the end of the noun. We can also use plural pronouns like we or they. Or we can combine our proper nouns into Ali and Rachel. Now we have to pick a verb to complete our sentence. Let's choose the verb walk. Now watch closely. If the subject is singular, we add an S to the end of our verb. However, if the subject is plural, we don't add S to the end of our verb. But we're not done yet. The boy walks. Ali and Rachel walk. Hmm, something is missing here. We have to add a little bit of detail to say where the subjects are going. So, let's complete our sentence by adding more information to this sentence. For example, the boy walks to school every day. Or we can write, Ali and Rachel walk to the park every evening. And that's how you write correct sentences using the simple present tense. Well, isn't it easy?
test your understanding about the simple present tense, let's see if you can identify some common errors in these sentences. He eats cereal for breakfast every day. Mama and Ravi goes fishing at the lake every weekend. In order to identify the errors in these sentences, you need to identify the subject in each sentence. By doing so, you can easily pinpoint the errors. You can apply this skill when you are writing your essay in the future. Well, are you ready? Let's check the answers. Our first sentence is, He eats cereal for breakfast every day. First, we need to identify the subject. The subject for this sentence is the pronoun he. It's a singular subject. Meanwhile, the verb in this sentence is eat. Compare the subject and the verb. Can you identify any error? If you look closely, the verb doesn't match the subject that we are using. He is a singular subject. So we have to add S to the verb eat. So the correct sentence will be, He eats cereal for breakfast every day. Did you answer correctly? <laughs> well done! Now, let's move to the next sentence. Our second sentence is, Mama and Ravi goes fishing at the lake every weekend. Now, let's identify the subject for this sentence. The subject in this sentence is Mama and Ravi. Like our previous sentence, the verb doesn't match the subject that we are using. Mama and Ravi is a plural subject because there are two people performing the same action. Hence, we have to omit ES from the verb. So the correct answer is Mama and Ravi go fishing at the lake every weekend. If you answered correctly, this means you have mastered the simple present tense. Well done! That's all for me. Thank you so much for watching. Till next time, bye bye! Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Apa khabar semua? Diharapkan semua dalam keadaan sihat walafiat dan sentiasa bersemangat untuk meneruskan pembelajaran Pada hari ini, murid-murid akan bersama-sama dengan saya Ustazah Nur Asia untuk mempelajari mata pelajaran Pendidikan Islam Topik yang akan dibincangkan pada kali ini ialah Tajuk Bidang Sirah dan Tamadun Islam Pelajaran ke-23 iaitu Perkembangan Ekonomi pada Zaman Kerajaan Abbasiyah Sebelum Ustazah meneruskan perkongsian topik ini adalah lebih baik murid-murid dapat menyediakan pen dan buku nota untuk mencatat isi-isi penting berkaitan tajuk ini. Pada akhir pembelajaran nanti, pastikan murid-murid dapat yang pertama, menyatakan sektor utama ekonomi kerajaan Abbasiyah. Yang kedua, menjelaskan sumber keuangan kerajaan Abbasiyah. Yang ketiga, menerangkan peranan Baitumal pada zaman kerajaan Abbasiyah. Dan yang terakhir, menghuraikan kesan pembangunan ekonomi terhadap rakyat pada zaman kerajaan Abbasiyah. Tahukah anda, bila berlakunya perkembangan ekonomi pada zaman kerajaan Abbasiyah dan siapakah khalifah yang memainkan peranan penting dalam perkara tersebut 
Ya, Alhamdulillah. Betul jawapan anda. Barangkali anda sudah mendapat info melalui pembacaan buku-buku berkaitan kegemilangan tamadun Islam ataupun melalui media masa. Baiklah murid-murid, perkembangan ekonomi pada zaman kerajaan Abbasiyah berlaku selepas Khalifah Abbasiyah yang kedua iaitu Khalifah Abu Ja'far Al-Mansur memindahkan pusat pemerintahan dari Damsyik ke kota Baghdad. Mengapakah kota Baghdad yang dipilih oleh Khalifah Abu Ja'far Al-Mansur? Dan apa pula keistimewaan kota Baghdad? Bagi memudahkan proses mengingat fakta ini, Ustazah lebih suka mencantumkan kesemua isi dalam satu perkataan pendek yang mudah difahami. Jawapannya ada di akronim KEPALA. Apa itu kepala? Akronim KE bermaksud kedudukan kota Baghdad yang strategik iaitu laluan perdagangan timur dan barat. Kalau kita lihat di skrin, jelas kelihatan kota Baghdad berada di tengah-tengah laluan antara timur dan barat. Akronim PA pula memberi makna terdapat sebuah pasar yang dikenali sebagai Suq Baghdad yang menjadi tumpuan para pedagang Parsi. Dan yang terakhir ialah akronim LA iaitu ladang. Terdapat ladang-ladang pertanian dan ternakan serta sebuah pasar yang dikenali sebagai Suq Al-Baqar. Baiklah murid-murid, mari kita lihat sumber keuangan atau sektor utama yang menyumbang kepada perkembangan ekonomi pada zaman kerajaan Abbasiyah. Tiga sumber tersebut Usazah simpulkan dalam akronim 3P. Apakah itu 3P? P yang pertama memberi maksud pertanian. Manakala P yang kedua ialah perindustrian. Dan P yang terakhir ialah perdagangan. Mari kita tinjau pula perincian setiap sektor utama yang menyumbang kepada perkembangan ekonomi kerajaan Abbasiyah. Murid-murid yang ustazah kasihi sekalian, apakah agaknya yang dilakukan oleh Khalifah Kerajaan Abbasiyah dalam memajukan sektor pertanian. Baiklah, antara usaha para Khalifah Abbasiyah dalam memajukan sektor ini ialah dengan memulih dan menambah prasarana pertanian. Antaranya ialah Membina saliran, melebarkan sungai dan terusan, membuat empangan, membuka tanah pertanian baru, membuat penyelidikan dalam bidang pertanian. Selain daripada itu, Kerajaan Abbasiyah juga 
telah menubuhkan satu jabatan khusus untuk mengendalikan urusan pengairan dan saliran iaitu yang dinamakan Diwan Al-Mak. Hasil daripada langkah positif ini, Kerajaan Abbasiyah telah muncul sebagai sebuah empayar terkemuka dalam bidang pertanian. Wilayah yang banyak mengeluarkan hasil pertanian ialah Mesir, Syam, Iraq, Yaman, Maghribi, Khurasan dan Andalus. Antara hasil pertanian yang diusahakan ialah hasil daripada bijirin seperti gandum, barley dan beras. Manakala hasil daripada buah-buahan pula contohnya anggur, limau, kurma, apple, pisang, tembikai, buah ting dan buah zaitun. Hasil daripada sayuran pula seperti timun, kobis, kunyit, kacang tanah, ubi, manisan dan tebu. Dan yang terakhirnya ialah daripada hasil ternakan. Contohnya, lembu, kambing, ayam, itik, lebah dan sebagainya. Melihat kepada hasil tanaman dan ternakan yang diusahakan oleh umat Islam pada zaman kerajaan Abbasiyah, dapat kita mengambil iktibar bahawa untuk mendapat kesenangan hidup di kemudian hari kita perlu bekerja keras mulai hari ini seperti maksud dalam peribahasa berakit-rakit ke hulu berenang-renang ke tepian bersakit-sakit dahulu Bersenang-senang kemudian Baiklah murid-murid Bagaimana pula dengan sektor kedua Yang menyumbang kepada perkembangan ekonomi Kerajaan Abbasiyah Kepesatan dalam industri pembuatan Menjadikan Kerajaan Abbasiyah sebuah negara industri yang terkemuka ketika itu dan dapat memenuhi keperluan masyarakat yang sudah berkembang maju. Terdapat pelbagai jenis industri pembuatan yang diusahakan pada zaman kerajaan Abbasiyah iaitu yang pertama Tenunan, hamparan dan permaidani dihasilkan dari wilayah Baghdad di Iraq dan Siraj serta Asfahan di Parsi. Pinggan mangkuk pula banyak dikeluarkan dari wilayah Mesir dan Syam. Barangan kaca Tembikar dan mozek dikeluarkan dari wilayah Baghdad, Mesir dan Syam. Manakala barangan kulit pula dan senjata dihasilkan dari wilayah Mesir, Andalus dan Maghribi. Manakala Perhiasan dan batu permata dari wilayah Yaman, Khurasan, Bahrain 
dan Lubnan Yang terakhir ialah Kertas Dikeluarkan Dari negara Iraq Mesir Maghribi Dan Andalus Terfikir tak murid-murid Umat Islam pada zaman kegemilangan kerajaan Abbasiyah ini Telah menguasai pasaran ekonomi di dunia Negara Islam telah menjadi pengeluar utama dalam sektor pembuatan Usaha gigi mereka telah melayakkan mereka menikmati fasa kegemilangan ini Oleh itu, anda perlu berusaha bersungguh-sungguh dalam pelajaran kerana kejayaan tidak akan datang tanpa adanya usaha gigih sebagaimana peribahasa yang bulat tidak datang bergolek dan yang pipih tidak datang melayang Baiklah murid-murid Sumber keuangan kerajaan Abbasiyah yang terakhir sekali berpunca daripada faktor perdagangan. Disebabkan kemajuan dalam sektor pertanian dan perindustrian menyebabkan aktiviti perniagaan dan perdagangan Berkembang pesat Selain itu Terdapat juga Faktor lain Yang menyumbang kepada Kepesatan sektor perdagangan Iaitu Yang pertama Pembukaan wilayah-wilayah baru Yang memberi Banyak ruang pasaran Perniagaan Yang kedua Perkembangan industri perkapalan Memudahkan Pergerakan para pedagang Yang ketiga Sarjana-sarjana Islam Telah menghasilkan Karya-karya yang menjelaskan tentang hukum hakam dalam perniagaan dan galakkan dalam berniaga. Yang keempat ialah kemahiran orang Arab berniaga sejak zaman jahiliah lagi. Selain itu, Kerajaan Abbasiyah juga telah memainkan peranan penting dalam perkembangan ekonomi Kerajaan Abbasiyah. Contohnya, membina pusat-pusat perniagaan yang dilengkapi perigi di jalan-jalan utama. Yang kedua, membina rumah-rumah api untuk panduan kapal pedagang. Dan yang ketiga ialah mengetatkan kawalan keselamatan untuk mengelakkan daripada perompak dan lanun. Pada masa yang sama juga, Wujud laluan sutra iaitu laluan perdagangan perdaratan yang terpanjang di dunia melibatkan China hingga Eropah. Para pedagang Muslim juga terlibat dengan laluan tersebut menyebabkan Ekonomi negara Islam semakin berkembang.
Baiklah murid-murid yang ustazah kasihi sekalian, kita masuk kepada isi kandungan yang kedua iaitu sumber keuangan kerajaan Abbasiyah. Terdapat enam sumber keuangan kerajaan Abbasiyah. Yang pertama ialah zakat. Zakat ialah kadar harta yang dikeluarkan oleh orang Islam terhadap harta-harta tertentu yang mencukupi had minimum iaitu nisab menurut syarat-syarat tertentu. Yang kedua ialah kharaj iaitu cukai tanah yang dikenakan ke atas milik orang bukan Islam dan milik orang Islam yang diperolehi melalui peperangan. Yang ketiga ialah ghanimah iaitu harta rampasan perang. Seterusnya ialah faid iaitu harta yang diperolehi melalui jalan perdamaian setelah pihak musuh menyerah kalah. Jizyah bayaran yang dikenakan kepada orang bukan Islam yang mendiami negara Islam. Dan yang terakhir ialah usyur iaitu bayaran tetap yang dikenakan ke atas kapal perdagangan bukan Islam yang singgah di pelabuhan negara Islam sebanyak 1 per 10. Jom kita tinjau pula isi kandungan yang ketiga iaitu peranan Baitul Mal dalam kerajaan Abbasiyah. Sebelum itu, Ustazah ingin membawa murid-murid mengenali dahulu organisasi yang terdapat di Baitul Mal pada zaman kerajaan Abbasiyah. Untuk pengetahuan semua murid, Baitul Mal diketuai oleh sahib Baitul Mal iaitu pengurus per- perbendaharaan negara. Peranan sahib Baitul Mal ialah menguruskan pendapatan dan perbelanjaan negara yang diketuai oleh Dewan Al-Kharaj iaitu Jabatan Hasil dan Dewan An-Nafaqah iaitu Jabatan Keuangan. Segala aktiviti kedua-dua jabatan ini dilaporkan kepada Baitul Mal dari masa ke semasa. Akaun Baitul Mal pula dikawal oleh Dewan Al-Usul iaitu Jabatan Dalam Negeri bersama dengan Dewan Al-Azimah iaitu Jabatan Audit Negara. Baitul Mal memainkan peranan penting dalam pengurusan keuangan negara iaitu sebagai pengurus sumber-sumber pendapatan negara menerusi Dewan Al-Kharaj iaitu Jabatan Hasil. Yang kedua, Dewan Al-Kharaj bertanggungjawab menguruskan kutipan cukai seperti 
الخرج الجزية الأشور dan juga zakat yang keduanya ialah Baitumal bertanggungjawab mengawal belanjawan negara melalui Dewan An-Nafakah iaitu Jabatan Keuangan Jabatan ini bertanggungjawab mengurus pendapatan dan perbelanjaan untuk semua jabatan kerajaan dan membayar gaji kaki tangan kerajaan Pengurusan kewangan yang sistematik telah membolehkan kerajaan Abbasiyah menyediakan prasarana yang baik untuk rakyat dan membangunkan negara Melihat kepada kesungguhan pemimpin kerajaan Abbasiyah dalam meningkatkan ekonomi negara menyebabkan umat Islam pada zaman kerajaan Abbasiyah telah menikmati taraf kehidupan yang tinggi yang kedua, kerajaan dapat meningkatkan penyediaan prasarana untuk keselesaan rakyatnya seperti tali air, membina sekolah, membina masjid, jalan dan sebagainya. Selain itu, kepesatan sektor ekonomi telah membuka peluang pekerjaan kepada rakyatnya. Kesimpulannya, hasil daripada perkongsian topi ini diharapkan kita semua dapat berusaha dengan lebih gigih untuk mencapai kejayaan. Dalam semua bidang, terutama dalam bidang ekonomi bagi mengembalikan imej tamadun Islam sifat amanah amat penting diamalkan dalam sesuatu institusi dan negara kerana keagungan tamadun Islam dibangunkan oleh generasi yang beramanah Sebelum berakhir pertemuan kita, mari kita lihat beberapa soalan untuk menguji minda anda. Soalan pertama, jelaskan dua sebab mengapa Abu Ja'far Al-Mansur memindahkan pusat pemerintahan dari Damshi ke kota Baghdad empat markah Soalan kedua Nyatakan dua daripada sumber keuangan kerajaan Abbasiyah dua markah Soalan ketiga Terangkan dua iktibar yang boleh anda pelajari daripada sejarah kerajaan Bani Abbasiyah dari sudut ekonomi empat markah Baiklah murid-murid kita dah sampai ke penghujung perbincangan Ustazah tinggalkan anda dengan serangkap pantun Pergi ke China Ada tembok raksasa Membawa balik Kain sutera Jangan malas Dan berputus asa Anda rugi Hidup merana 
kita jumpa lagi di pembelajaran seterusnya. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.